afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining the World Affairs Council Upstate for today's America and the World Flashpoints Lecture, Pandemic Power Plays, Civil Liberties or Public Health. Approximately 80 years ago during the Great Depression, Franklin D. Roosevelt said, true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. In more recent history, Anne Rand said, either we believe that the state exists to serve the individual or that the individual exists to serve the state. As we look at those topics today, among others, we welcome our guests to approach individual freedoms and the cost to those freedoms that are either occurring or might occur during this COVID-19 crisis. As always, our World Affairs Council Upstate is a non-political, non-partisan organization dedicated to bringing you the most fact-based information that we can from a broad range of perspectives. We ask you, if you're not a member already, to consider joining us to support this type of global engagement and broadening of minds. Today's presentation is made possible through the partnership and generous support of the South Carolina Fulbright Association. Uh, we have with us one of our own World Affairs Council Upstate Steering Board members and president of the South Carolina Fulbright Association, Dr. Alex Akuli, and I'd like to invite him to tell you just a little bit about South Carolina Fulbright. Alex? Great, thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Akuli. I serve as the director of the Center for International Studies at the University of South Carolina Upstate. And I'm also the incoming president of the South Carolina Fulbright Association. The Fulbright Association promotes and supports international education and mutual understanding at home and abroad. Fulbright Association extends the international exchange experiences of our U.S. alumni into lifelong experiences in service to people-to-people -to -people diplomacy. The Fulbright alumni are exceptional academics from all areas of study. Through their service abroad, Fulbrighters bring American values to all corners of the world. And in doing so, they also bring home rich perspectives and deeper understanding of their host communities abroad. I'm delighted that today one of the presenters uh, is Dr. Catherine Barbieri, who is also a, Ful a Fulbright alumni. Thank you for joining us today. And now I'd like to turn it over to the chairman of the board, uh, Mr. Rob, McCor Rob Rowan, to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And thank you again for your support and from the Fulbright program, which I know, congratulations, as being the new president for South Carolina. Um, we have two amazing speakers today as we explore this topic and I'm so glad I get to introduce them. From Jerusalem, how's that? Israel, we have Sahara Vardy, an Israeli activist based there. She's active in human rights causes in Israel and the Palestinian territories. Her work has been recognized by the Noble Woman's Initiative. Sahara is the Israel Program Manager for the American Friends Service Committee based there in Jerusalem. And her work focuses on the militarization of Israeli society, looking at both social, and educational aspects, as well as the arms industry and export. She's a board member of the Human Rights Defenders Fund and active in many anti-occupation grassroots movements in the Palestine Israel area. Thank you, Sahar, for coming from so far away. And from the University of South Carolina in Columbia, we have Dr. Captain Barberi, who, as Alex mentioned, is a past Fulbright scholar who was in Israel doing that in 2010. She's associate professor there at the University of South Carolina and the vice chair of the Department of Political Science. Her expertise resides in the area of international relations, international political economy, and the scientific study of conflict. She's particularly interested in international trade, war, and economic activities in the war zones. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in international relations and IP including globalization, security, and the political economy of war. She's interested in the impact of the pandemic on domestic politics and international relations, which fits into why she's here today. And our dapper moderator today is our very own expert on the Middle East, 
living in Travelers Rest, Nathan Stock. No stranger to issues on unrest, Nathan, having led the Carter Center in uh, Israel, Palestine field office for three and a half years. Now this expert, it, as I said, is a lives in Travelers Rest, where he consults and writes on Israeli-Palestinian affairs and can often be found on the campus of Furman University. And with that, take it away, Nathan. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Rob, for the introduction, uh, and Sahar and Catherine for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, just a note to all our guests this afternoon, kindly please keep your microphones muted and your video feeds off. Uh, but uh, as soon as the presentations begin, at any point you're welcome to type questions into the chat function. There'll be plenty of time for discussion after Catherine and Sahar finish. Uh, and once they're done, I will read out and curate the questions more or less in the order they're submitted and we'll try to address as many comments as we can. So kindly keep your mics muted, but feel free uh, to type questions in and we will get to them after our two presentations. So with that, uh, allow me to turn it over to our first presenter, uh, Sahar Vardi with the American Friends Service Committee. Sahar. Uh, thank you. So good afternoon to you all. I'm just going to share my screen here for a moment. Um, just to kind of start off this conversation, um, I think the, the general framing of the conversation really has been around this kind of liberties uh, versus public health and how that is playing out in different places. Um, and I know Catherine will speak much more, obviously, to how that looks like in the U.S. and how that plays out. And I think there you'll see the, the I mean, most of you are in the U.S. and living that conversation and what does it mean. Um, so I will say that most of what I'm going to speak about um, at this point is actually much more about kind of the places where uh, severe measures are being um, introduced much more so than, than the conversation uh, that's happening right now in the U.S., but we'll, we'll kind of get to that uh, later. So that was just to kind of begin with. Um, and just for the general setting, uh, I'm going to use some uh, theory that is definitely not mine, uh, and a lot of you probably have been uh, kind of hearing this lately. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how the ideas of uh, the shock doctrine that Naomi Klein kind of talks about, this idea of in times of crisis, it is easier to kind of push forward um, ideas that are already waiting around uh, and, and make them part of our reality, uh, an idea that um, a good quote of, of Milton Friedman talking about that, um, about how crisis is what creates actual change. That is something that I think is kind of following or, or in the background of a lot of us um, that are seeing in civil society what's happening right now, how governments are reacting to this and are very much afraid that this is one of those moments where change is happening through crisis. Um, and we need to be able to monitor it, to understand what are the changes that are happening because they need to, because there needs to be a reaction to a pandemic, and what are the changes that are happening that are actually an opportunity um, for governments, including uh, some very oppressive regimes, to kind of push their agenda. And I think that that's generally one of the things that I'll, I'll try to look at today uh, and a little bit of a, a global view of, of what that means and what that um, looks like. Um, so maybe just to start, uh, we'll talk about a lot of different measures that states have been putting in uh, in the last few months since COVID has started. But I do want again to kind of just really start by saying, I totally understand that there is a need for that. We are in a global pandemic. Um, no one should be ignoring that. And, and I'll get to it at the end of, of what I'm saying, kind of what are some alternatives, but to say criticizing the measures that are used by states doesn't mean that we don't need measures, doesn't mean that we don't take this seriously and that we don't take public health um, seriously. But what we do need to notice is are there measures being introduced with the intention of use after the pandemic and kind of being kept in that? Um, is, are these restrictions that are put on civil space really being used to solidify power uh, in a way that is later on um, harder for civil society to act generally, and we'll see some examples of that. Um, is there new legislation being passed? And we've seen a lot of examples, even of, you know, in France, uh, that the government is just 
past legislation or parliament has passed legislation that has nothing to do with COVID just because before COVID there were mass protests about it and you couldn't pass it and then there was COVID and now you can just pass it. I'm completely unrelated um, and generally kind of looking at how this affects minorities differently um, than, uh, than hegemonic uh, groups. Um, so just as kind of some of the really big changes that are happening as a starting point. Um, I took here three examples, but I'll say that there are quite a lot of places where we're starting to see or already seeing real actual structural change happening in governments uh, to a far less democratic place. Um, so we've seen the president of, of Brazil, Bolsonaro, in a protest, joining a protest, first of all, joining a protest at this time, which is uh, an issue in and of itself, but joining a protest uh, that is calling for the abolishment of the Supreme Court and Parliament uh, and the return of a military dictatorship. So this is a president saying this is kind of what we're pushing for um, during this pandemic. Hungary is obviously one of the, the most severe cases that we've already seen um, with a declaration of a state of danger. It's kind of a state of emergency declaration um, that has passed and allows government to rule by decree uh, and not need parliament to approve its measures. And unlike in the past when this has been used in Hungary historically twice already, it always had a time limit and now it doesn't. Um, so really that's kind of a structural change. And as an Israeli, I'll just say that we had our moment that I'm, I'm happy to say that that shifted. Uh, but there was a moment um, at the beginning of COVID in which our Speaker of the House that was exiting because of a change of government refused to uh, allow Parliament to meet, uh, even with the Supreme Court trying to force him to. So just to say that this moment of kind of crisis, of global crisis, really allows governments when they want to, um, and if they feel like they do have uh, the, some support for that, to push for extremely um, undemocratic uh, directions and, and that's kind of the the background that we are uh, looking at uh, in here. One of the things that we've seen quite a lot happening globally is really surveillance measures. Um, again, I can say that here in Israel we have seen um, geolocation tracking of phones being used. Uh, we've seen around the world drones being used, electronic bracelets, uh, personal barcodes, facial recognition programs, um, and this is really a, a huge range of, range of countries that are using these measures. The graph that you can uh, see on the right is just a small survey that we did. We only have 30 something countries represented here, uh, but you can already see that we have quite a few countries taking on uh, phone location tracking, um, as well as facial recognition. There's been a lot of developments around these things, so things that a few months ago, a lot of governments were checking out how do you do facial recognition with masks on because it was relevant for them in, in protests. Or, for instance, the Chinese government has been dealing with how do you deal with the fact that most of the protesters in Hong Kong use masks. Uh, and so, facial, uh, facial recognition programs have not been that effective. Now, during COVID, they actually had an amazing opportunity to roll out new technology um, that can now also do facial recognition with masks and kind of say this is a national priority um, because of COVID, because of the, the existence of masks. But for instance, what does that mean now for those protesters in Hong Kong? Um, so these measures are, are interesting. It's also interesting to see that it means that these governments have already had the ability to do these things. I don't remember, I don't know if you all remember that, that Snowden moment um, where it wasn't only a question of can the NSA listen to things that people are, are saying, obviously they can, but this realization that, that there is, that there is actual uh, surveillance of phones in the US. Um, and governments now, for instance, again, my own government, the Israeli government, when the security service said we can give uh, the Ministry of Health phone location tracking, um, they didn't say we can give them from now, they said we can give them back if you want. Tell us how long you want them back, we will give them to you. And that should have been a moment where we say, wait, what? Well, um, but this is kind of, there's a normalization of this because it's for a good cause, because it's to be able to prevent uh, a pandemic from going around. And again, there's a normalization of this. After now, we might still be kind of hesitant about it, but if this is helpful and if phone location tracking is helpful in the hands of a government to deal with a pandemic, maybe we won't be um, as afraid of this idea in the future. Maybe governments will be able to normalize it. So these are things, and again, phone locations may be the easiest 
of these measures, the using drones in, in civilian space for things of the sort. Um, and again, facial recognition is something that should be uh, rather alarming. This includes now facial recognition systems introduced into hospitals here in the country. Uh, so there's kind of a lot, um, a lot that we need to be aware of in, in this context. Uh, another thing that we are seeing a lot is obviously bans on gatherings and protests. And again, bans on gatherings in this context make a lot of sense. Uh, this is a highly contagious virus and putting a lot of people in one place is dangerous. Um, and I don't want to dismiss that. Um, but there is a question of what do you do with those bans? How are they implemented? What is and isn't uh, allowed in that context? And one of the things that we see very clearly is extremely discriminatory imp implementation, implementation of these bans. Um, so you'll really see protests in the same country where if it's a protest that's pro-government, uh, they'll be allowed to protest or even the president of that country will join. And if it's protests against government, uh, then the context will be extremely different and there will be a repression and arrests around it. Um, obviously, uh, the protests in Hong Kong again have just restarted and the way that the Chinese uh, government, mainland government is, is at the moment um, fighting them is through arrests that have to do with violation of social distancing. Um, so this is kind of becoming a, an interesting thing. It's not just forms of protest that are um, on the streets and therefore, yes, we can agree kind of dangerous for public health, but also forms of protest that are online. Um, we've seen a huge, huge surge in legislation around fake news. And again, I want to say fake news is not a good thing and it's obviously very problematic and can be dangerous, but we are seeing governments passing laws, for instance, in Zimbabwe have up to 20 years in jail for fake news that have to do with a virus. And who defines what fake news are? Um, and there's a lot of conversation about countries, states, um, that are denying the level of uh, infection within their population. When people do publish things about that, that could be considered fake news. Uh, I was speaking to activists in, in Myanmar who were talking about the fact that when uh, laws of the sort pass there, uh, their feeling was that can just be used against anything they ever say against the government will be, will be defined as fake news and, and you can't prove that that's not true. Um, and then these measures are used against you. So that's kind of another thing that, that, that's happening is very scary. I will just say, uh, again, this graph on the left, first of all, obviously, most countries that have um, been affected by, by COVID uh, severely have bans and gatherings, but when we asked members of civil society if these bans and gatherings have been used to cover up other repressive actions, the majority of them said yes. And when we asked who's passing these, the majority of them said it's the executive branch uh, that has a decision about this. So again, if we're thinking about kind of democratic systems, right, you'd want these kind of things to pass through parliament, but what things, what crises like COVID uh, allow is for that to, to not be done by, by in, in due process, not through the legislative councils, um, but through uh, the executive branch and kind of giving much more authority and power to that executive branch. Um, the last topic that I'll talk about kind of in, in that kind of general, what does it look like in different places of the world is really enforcement, where I think this is really one of the places that we kind of see the harshest reality uh, around what do extreme measures actually look like. Um, the, the first example here slide is, is around Kenya police that in the implementation of curfews has actually killed more people in Kenya than COVID has. Um, and that, that's not the only country where that is the case. South Africa has pretty similar numbers. Um, and so we're seeing countries where the, the literally the main threat is not actually the virus. It is the enforcement of police uh, around curfews. Um, other places where we've seen people put in cages uh, with humiliation, and again, this is important, this is not enforced equally anywhere, right? It's always the same population, populations that were already marginalized. Um, these things are enforced differently uh, against them. And so in the Philippines, we've, we've seen LGBTQ people um, ordered to kiss uh, and dance on video for breaking curfew. So obviously this is not related one to another. It's just that when you already have a marginalized oppressed group, 
um, than like in, in any case in the world, that is the group that police usually targets. And when you give police more power and tell them, go ahead, um, you have all this, this power to, um, to try to implement a curfew, that is what it's going to look like. And again, this is from around the world, you'll have the same in, in France. Uh, had a, a lot of violence against against specifically minorities in that context. Um, I'm sorry about the part in Hebrew. I just didn't find a good translation of that, but that just ha speaks to uh, fines that were given. So the Israeli police have given 34 million shekels uh, in fines, which was I don't know, a, bit, a little bit over $10 million. Um, and this is actually from a week and a half ago. That number has, has risen since. Uh, we have similar numbers, I think about $90 million in Romania. Um, so the, the kind of enforcement and what does it mean on uh, civilians, especially in a time where there is an economic crisis, very clearly, is also something we really need to kind of um, take into uh, account. Um, the next slide is, it really focuses on, on the context of, of here, of the Palestinian-Israeli context and, and the occupation. Um, but I'm, I'm using it as an example. I don't want this to be about the occupation, but it's just one of the interesting things um, is to see how enforcement is done again in the context of a, a system that, that um, oppresses a specific group. And in the context of the Israeli occupation, uh, we've seen, for instance, the enforcement towards Palestinians in East Jerusalem, but also in other places, has include uh, mass, and there's literally raids of dozens and dozens of police vehicles, each one of them packed with eight police officers, which already is, is so far from what you want uh, when we talk about dealing with a global pandemic, coming into neighborhoods in masses. Uh, and usually what happens when police enter neighborhoods in masses in full riot gear is that a riot starts. Um, and that is to an extent to be expected, but it is one of those questions, and why are you doing this in the middle of a pandemic? Um, and I think that that question is important and it has to do, uh, Israel also shut uh, Palestinian testing clinics for, for COVID, arrested Palestinian officials who were collecting um, relief money for Palestinians uh, and, and things of the sort. But I think the interesting question uh, that comes up there is why is it that there's some forms of enforcement that police just continues as usual um, that actually endangers population and then at the same time we're supposed to be obedient to the police in and believe them that they are uh, taking care of us for public health and this creates a huge problem because it creates distrust with entire communities communities that usually already have distrust with police um, so just to say I don't again I don't think that we shouldn't be social distancing and shouldn't be uh, listening to what states um, do decree when they do I'm just saying that this shows way deeper problems that we have, which really have to do with the fact that entire communities are used to being oppressed by police and therefore are not going to be convinced by a police raid to, that, that this is actually for their, their uh, own public good. Um, I'm gonna end uh, with that, but just with kind of a, a general uh, sentence about this, which is that I think that while the, the heading uh, of this talk was really about liberties or public health and this kind of, um, I don't know if it's a, a scale that we try to find out where we are on it. Uh, I do want to say that, that I think that that is in many ways a false binary that we need to step out of. Uh, the, the picture here is just a protest that was taking place in Israel a couple of weeks ago, but as you can see, very well social distance. There were marks on the floor, two meters apart, um, and, and it's just to say you can find ways that are about allowing the freedoms and liberties that we want in a democracy and not be a risk to public health. Um, education has proven itself to be much more effective than in other forms of enforcement. In general, research around the world, uh, around um, more or less every findable offense you can think about. Uh, there are civilian alternatives to tracking, uh, to monitor location that are not uh, militarized, that are not owned by the state, that don't have the same privacy issues. Mutual aid projects uh, have been effective um, in making people actually stay at home and shelter at home. And so there's a lot of kind of ways to think about this in a more social level, uh, which I hope we'll be able to continue uh, later on in, in our conversations. Um, so thank you.
Thank you very much, Sahar. Uh, if I could ask you to turn the screen back over, uh, we will switch to Dr. Catherine Barbary. Okay, hi. One second. Now I have to. Um, okay, so that's not working, right? Oh, one second. Can you see it okay now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I just want to talk about uh, the approach. Can you also turn your video on oh. so we can see you while you're speaking. Okay, maybe you don't need. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. So in political science, so let me just see. Okay. So in political science, what we typically do is try to look at trends that are happening and generalize about those trends. And we look as much as possible about the data and try to be objective in terms of measuring different things. So when I say, what is the ideal type here? So when asked about the impact of COVID on repression or a restriction of civil liberties, the question is, has this actually been happening? Have we seen a restriction on civil liberties? Have we seen um, a suspension of rule of law? And I would argue that very little has changed about world politics and, and there has been heightened attention to the question of whether repression is going on in an anti-democratic trend. And I, I would argue that there's very little that has changed if anything, people are just seeing what world politics is about, what international politics is about, what's always there in the background that we don't pay attention to. So Sahar mentioned Snowden, for example. That was going on for years before people were aware of it. I think those studying intelligence, those studying security were aware of what was happening. And the same is the case today that things happen in world politics that we don't pay attention to. So what the COVID virus is doing is it's shining a light on many of the situations around the world that happen, whether it's discrimination against minorities, that there's nothing new about this. This is world politics and whether we want to pay attention or not is a different issue. So in international relations, we tend to look at different levels of analysis. We look at the global system and international system and there I would say one of the things that has been a focus of international relations scholars is concerns about who might be the global leader in the world. And there's, um, there's a lot of speculation that China would be the global leader. And so there, there's concerns about what kind of system that would be if China in fact emerges. Um, on the other level, we look at states or nation states, I mean here, and then how are governments organized? What is their responsibility towards their people? Um, what do their people demand? What's the unrest going on? How does that affect the globe? How do international crises affect domestic stability? All of those kinds of issues we also deal with. And then at the individual level, how are individuals impacted by these trends? Um, and then what we also see going on now is the debate about minimalist versus interventionist states. And so in international political economy that I teach about, I spend a lot of time talking about that, that there is this ideal type of openness and liberalism and globalization that wants to see minimal borders. And on the other side, you have either economic nationalism or communism that all see an interventionist role for the state. And so these are two extremes. And most political scientists and economists have tried to develop measures that look at a continuum on both the political spectrum um, in terms of liberties, but also on the economic spectrum in terms of economic freedom or state intervention. A state intervention can be in any variety of ways, whether it's offering incentives or disincentives to behavior. These, these incentives or disincentives should shape behavior. So I just, um, so I guess my point is that in international relations and political economy, we've had a lot of these same debates for an extended period of time. We can look back to the past because the greatest predictor of the future, we would say, is the past. So in that respect, um, we see a lot of trends, but 
more importantly, what we see from the past is that the behaviors that states had before COVID continue. So when we're talking about a restriction to civil liberties, they really, our definition of civil liberties varies across the world. That is, what are citizens, um, what are their rights with respect to the state and their protections from states across the world? And again, that, consider, that varies considerably. Um, so when we talk about Western democracies, it's a very different picture than what we see in repressive regimes, autocratic regimes. And so it tends to be those autocracies that continue what has always been their practices. They're not behaving differently. China isn't doing anything differently in terms of cracking down on Hong Kong protesters. It's doing what has consistently been the pattern. And in, I would say the same is true of the U.S., that the U.S. has continued to maintain a respect for rule of law. The things that have been adopted have been consistent with the Constitution. There's been a shift, um, as, is, as promised in the Constitution, where states have a greater role in guaranteeing the health of people, um, or at least protecting from a health crisis that that transfers over to the state. And those lines have been protected. There's been pushbacks and protests. I saw someone ask a question about that protest in the US. And that's again about individual rights and freedoms. The fact that we see these protests and people picking up guns and protesting means that the democracy is healthy, that they're able to, people are able to articulate their preferences and push for change within a democratic system. So in my view, the authoritarian regimes continue to behave the same. Um, if anything, we're seeing the same trends. We're seeing um, shining the light on international politics, which is good in many respects. Um, so let me see, hold on. Okay, so what I would say in terms of surveillance, has there been a considerable shift? And I would argue, that there's no shift with this virus, that we should realize for decades that we have been monitored, individuals, groups, states, states monitor each other, they monitor dissident groups, and the question of who is watching may be relevant, but what we also have to realize is that there, our conception of privacy should have changed a long time ago. Um, there's a new norm, and that is that the internet isn't private. Right now, with this conversation, anybody can join it, right? We don't know who has joined. We don't know um, if you have an activist on. You don't know who's joining. We have to assume it's open to anyone who wants to view it. And who wants to view it? Well, who knows? Sometimes it's businesses in order to increase sales of products, um, in order to shape your voting patterns, you have political groups watching it, that all of these data have been compiled and used by businesses, by governments, by anyone else. At least in the US, we know that if they're gonna use something that we do online, they have to go through, the government has to go through certain procedures to allow due process of law. So right now what we've seen is attention to different surveillance techniques, facial recognition, all of those things aren't new. They come out of the shadows of international politics at times like this because they have to be used more readily. But we didn't overnight see the adoption or the development of these technologies. They have been there. It's just that in cases where, let's say someone wants to bring a case to court, the police are not permitted to introduce evidence from these surveillance techniques unless they've acquired them legitimately. That doesn't mean they're not acquiring all the information all the time. Again, governments are doing this all the time. Police authorities are doing this all the time. Businesses are doing all this time. Individuals are spying on each other. Those with hacking capabilities are doing it. So I think there has to be a greater awareness of surveillance that it's become the norm of our reality for good or bad, that we have very little private behavior. What's surprising to me is that we see the younger generation that should be aware that they have no privacy, that they're surveyed in everything that they do. 
I've told people there's no privacy online. And in fact, um, recently the classes have moved online. Students are aware of surveillance. They're aware, faculty are aware that we're operating on state-owned computers and anything we do through the university account is monitored. That surprisingly hasn't led to such a change of behavior. I have students still telling me that they weren't able to get access to something when in my day, in the technology that we have available, we see everything that the student's able to do. We see if they're present in the class or not. We see if, if their internet connection is broken. We see if they get access to a test or don't. And still I'm told, uh, you know, and it's, it's surprising for me that they're aware that I have this technology and yet they still create excuses in the same way that I think the general public should be aware that anyone has access, um, any hacker can get onto our camera, any government agency can get onto our camera, police, our, our web camera. And still, if you look at any of the recent stories about dating sites, you see how many people are doing things that they probably don't want the world to know, um, and they're doing it online in a public space. So we have to learn to treat um, the internet as a public space rather than a private space, however much we want it to be otherwise. My goal as a political scientist isn't to say, well, this is good or bad. I have my personal opinions about that. It's to say what is happening in the world, right? And the reality is that there's, there's no privacy on the internet. Um, so we're witnessing reality of international politics with a light on it. So with respect to sovereign, to states and international relations, so how arbitrary are emergency powers when we say, well, are states restricting civil liberties? In fact, we've seen a consistency with rule of law and what states dictate. The problem in international relations is that states have a right to do what they want within their borders. And that's the key principle of international relations, that a state has the right to make and enforce laws within our territory. So what we see in the US, I would say has been a healthy respect for those laws in terms of honoring the constitution and still you see individuals pushing back. What we've seen in authoritarian regimes is consistency there. There's been a lot of attention to Hungary and its restriction of parliament. Hungary still is within the European Union, which is a democratic community. So even for political scientists creating measures of civil liberties and the respect for civil liberties, um, the EU and Hungary are above the world average for civil liberties. And if, the, if Hungary wants to remain within the EU, it's gonna to have to answer to those broader laws. So again, these are Western democracies living under those principles. And so they are still, the states within them are confined by that. There's a supranational institution there that guides the behavior of its members. Within the broader international relations community, we don't have that. We have no global um, regulator, we have no enforcer, we have only norms. And again, this takes me back to my concern earlier, is that with, with speculation about the U.S. declining as the global hegemon and potentially China rising, we have to recognize that it's the global leader that is going to set the stage for norms. Um, the U.S. did that in the post-war II era in terms of encouraging openness to trade. Now there's been a retraction from that, not just by the U.S., but throughout the world. Um, hopefully, all democratic states will still abide by the, the norms of democracy and honoring the rule of law that their people help to promote. Um, the question, of course, is what will happen if China were to rise up in, in terms of becoming the global hegemon. And I think that what we're seeing is um, the norms of autocracy would then possibly become more global. Um, so there's concerns from international relations scholars about that. Um, 
Okay, so within the US, I, I'm, I'm happy to discuss, obviously I'm used to lecturing for too long, um, but I, I'm happy to discuss these individual things. And as I was saying, within the US, we see battles among states about the different policies and the problems of coordinating policies. So one state in terms of US states, as opposed to international states, states are the ones with the power in this respect, which the constitution gives them to basically decide what they want to do in a public health crisis. And you don't have to, there's nothing that the federal government can do to force states to open up. Um, they can assist them, the federal government can assist states, but it cannot force them to open up. So when we see calls by Trump to open up the economy, still the federal government can't force them. Federal government, on the other hand, does have the right under the Commerce Clause to basically restrict trade from other countries, and that can include travel, um, travel bans. It does have that right to regulate commerce, and it's used that right, but in terms of other regulations, it is restricted. So states retain their power. Local police forces have a lot of power. Recently, sheriffs have asserted their power. They're elected officials who try to satisfy the people's desires. So they're doing things in response to what people in their community want. And sometimes that's a push by some who, um, minorities that express their concerns to open up the economy or to carry guns and to use them, um, that they're asserting their rights. But again, that to me is part of um, the democratic process where people are debating whether they want the economy open or closed, what, what the state should be doing in terms of public health. Um, okay, so I would say that my concern these days as an American and as watching what's happening in the US is that it's extremely difficult to even get at the facts. Um, people are obsessed with social media, especially younger people, um, but but everyone these days is obsessed with it and they're not always informed about fake news. Um, we claim that we're informed about it, but people continue to digest what are often, and even academics, um, they will post things about, again, authoritarianism in, in the US or something like that, and they don't fact check. People are very quick to share and turn to authorities and what they say as somehow that's true or fact. And so much of the media in the US today is biased towards one political party or the other. It is what most people would say is, is the problem with this crisis is that China was surrounding a city of 11 million people and the US, most Americans were fixated on the impeachment of the president. Um, so things were happening outside the borders and people were just watching whatever silo they were committed to, whether it was left or right, they were watching those news sources and feeding um, the partisanship divide. So that's been a problem, just getting facts about the disease or about other things, how to respond to it. Everything is filtered through partisanship. So again, that's part of democracy. It's up to the citizens to educate themselves about the manipulation of data, about disinformation. We haven't done enough about that. And again, as much as I try to do that with students, they still um, seem to not pay so much attention to it. So in terms of other trends that I see, what's interesting is that we see very much a left and right convergence. So we see these extremes on the left and right, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, and both of them are calling for the same thing. So if I were to predict what trends, it's difficult to say now. We, have, we don't have sufficient data, but we do see the left and the right converging, and it's the moderates that will have to balance them. Um, this call for anti-establishment candidates in the US um, and throughout the world to have people who aren't politicians running politics um, is for some a concern, you know, because you're taking the people who are experts and throwing them out. Okay, I think I'm well out of time. Okay, so just in terms of what I would say is that, that we're living politics as it is and we're seeing what international politics is about, surveillance, watching people, um, arresting dissidents in authoritarian states, shooting people. It's all part of international politics as, as depressing as that is, that's the reality of it. Um, okay, so I'll leave it to the activists to change things.
Okay. Thank I'm you very much, Catherine. Okay. Um, so uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. And if I can look into our chat function, um, we have uh, an initial question from Rob Rowan, the chair of the World Affairs Council uh, Steering Board. Uh, I'm going to share Rob's question with our two panelists uh, and give them time to respond. In the meantime, all of you are welcome to type in any further questions. If you would like to direct your question to one panelist or the other, um, um, so. Uh, Rob writes that in the U.S. Uh, we've seen more protests by um, the right wing that have been uh, protesting governments that are trying to uh, maintain coronavirus lockdowns. Um, whereas in other parts of the world, there have been more protests from the left. Um, is this something that's, that's is, is the U.S. the only place where you're seeing uh, uh, protests of a more conservative bent against uh, public health lockdowns. Um, Catherine, do you know? I think, well, well, I think that there are other people, it's not just in the U.S. that we see protest over government action. So there's been greater demands for health attention, but also in terms of opening up. So Italy was one of the first cases hit, and there are a lot of people who have done everything. I mean, at first they were skirting the laws that were, well, they weren't laws, they were administrative acts. And so people went out regardless of, of restrictions, right? So they were breaking it and now they were pushing. That's one of the reasons why we see the lifting of the lockdown is that people wanna, um, want these lockdowns lifted, I guess, you could, the restrictions lifted. Yeah, and I've seen, seen the same in, in Brazil. Uh, so we're talking about a right-wing government um, that much like in the U.S. because of a state system, uh, it is the governors who have decided about lockdowns. And so you've seen really, I mean, more or less the same, uh, where there have been strong lockdowns, there have been strong protests of the right uh, around it. Um, Poland, uh, to an extent, has had similar things. So yeah, I mean, this is definitely a global phenomenon. Hmm. Thanks, Sahar. The Brazil analogy is, is certainly relevant to the United States. Um, so a question from Tracy Fries, Director International. Uh, she notes uh, about censorship from uh, Facebook and YouTube, which is owned by Google. Uh, she points out that there are um, two doctors in California that had uh, their research on COVID death rates uh, removed because Google decided that it went against uh, the accepted wisdom of the World Health Organization. How do we address censorship of science, um, especially in cases where there's some variance between what one expert is saying and, and, uh, and another? I, I think in the case of Facebook and Google, they've been saying recently that they're going to do more to patrol the internet. So in other countries, I just read something about um, how Google and Facebook made a mistake to not censor what they were doing. So they allowed a lot of disinformation about other crises to spread. And there has been a lot of um, attention to them for doing that. So. So for example, drinking bleach or bathing in bleach, that those kinds of rumors have spread on, on the internet in some countries. And the concern here is that they Google and internet, uh, Google and Facebook want to prevent that. So what they did is they developed a lot of algorithms um, and they're facing the same thing with restriction on people going to work because of the virus. So I know in political science, faculty were getting outraged that they were having things removed and they thought that it was because of the political positions they were taking. And it had very little to do with that. It had to do with the algorithms that they were running. They were relying much more on technology and those, those general algorithms rather than people monitoring 
the, the feeds because they didn't have the people, they weren't working. So again, part of it was real, was not real censorship. It was other than pulling down anything that was going up that recommended things that may not be good. And so, so again, I, I think there's going to be more careful and, and I don't know. So if what I, I think what I hear you saying, Catherine, is that we should be a little careful to to criticize them for for saying that they're censoring information. Fact, they're just pulling the down all the things that get posted um, and they're doing it in a very general sweeping way. It's just like any other surveillance. So after 9-11, anyone i mean there was a lot of attention to anyone talking about bombs for example where there was one woman in britain who was talking about her daughter bombing in a play and she was then monitored she was monitored for talking about a bomb and that word picked up tracking right so whenever you have these general um, computer programs or listening devices looking for particular words they're gonna people will get caught up in the sweep. And so the same was it true with Facebook, is that you do have right and left and conspiracy groups spreading false information. And Facebook and Google have been attacked for allowing that to happen. They're private companies. They can do to some extent what they want to do. Um, and they're responding to demands by people and governments that they stop allowing you know, different conspiracies to run. If they're gonna stop that, how do they do that? If you look at how much is posted on Google and Facebook every day, um, on Twitter, how do you get things removed? Well, the way that they're doing it is through computer programming, going through and looking for certain words and pulling everything down. Um, so it's just, if you were to see some of the things that got pulled down and political scientists screaming about, and, and immediately all the political scientists thought that they were being attacked for criticizing Trump or something like that, when in fact it was just um, Facebook explained that it was being, that, that they hadn't done it, it was a computer algorithm that took their, their posting down. So how did you want to jump in on that? Um, I think just in the interest of, of time and a lot of other questions there, I'll, I'll skip. Okay. So let me take a couple of questions uh, related to the situation in the U.S. Um, uh, Christine Braswell Amin writes, uh, she's seen cases in other countries outside the U.S. where the COVID response is being used for nefarious purposes to restrict civil liberties. But she asked the U.S. Have we seen examples of COVID response uh, being manipulated to repress civil liberties or freedom of expression? And a related question comes in from Bob Fannin. Uh, in the U.S., what are the parameters of the ability of the U.S. executive to operate under a state of emergency? What, what, are, what are the things that can be done by the White House in a state of emergency, could that lead to things like shutting down the U.S. Congress or um, imposing martial law or things of that nature? Uh, so maybe Catherine, you could start on that. So I don't think, I think governments have a large degree of discretion when it comes to emergency powers and that's throughout the world and those powers might be adopted because of a natural disaster, um, war, civil unrest, but in, in this case, um, sorry, I, I'm just getting notices. Um, so, so they may be coming from that, but in terms of the, the government being able to do it, I, I think that it's clearly articulated what goes to the state and we're not going to see martial law come about because of this. What, what private companies can do is very different than what the state can do. So it may be the case that private companies will share data or sell data that they acquire, but that doesn't mean that the government can do it. And the federal government certainly, um, we see throughout the world these fights between local governments and national governments, and we see that in the U.S. now. But the federal government isn't sending troops into states. You know, if states request it, they might do that, but they're not sending them in. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you you broke up a little bit on the end. I there. know. That's what I maybe I have to turn off the video. Yeah. Um. Uh. Okay. Um. Let me shift gears slightly because I've had a, a question or two on. Uh, Israeli-Palestinian affairs, and since we have Sahar on, I thought I would ask. Um, uh, we have John Davis noting that uh, U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo is in Israel today. Uh, he is wondering, Sahar, if you could comment on what the implications of some Israeli move to annex the West Bank might be. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is something that's been uh, in the works uh, for quite uh, a while uh, with this annexation. Uh, but I do think that, that the, I mean, first of all, the fact that the, sec the U.S. Secretary of State is even on um, a, a trip right now here, he just landed this morning, uh, the fact that that's even still happening um, in the time of a pandemic should, should be a, its own question. But as Catherine says, many things are actually just continuing as they are. Uh, but I think what this timing does mean uh, is that there is less attention to it. Um, we do know that the foreign ministers of uh, the European Union are meeting this Friday, and this is going to be the main issue that they will be talking about, the annexation plans um, of parts of the West Bank. Um, and so there still is kind of international interest on this, but probably the ability of European governments, for instance, to react to this um, might not be as much as a priority as it would have been uh, before this, when, when you know, they, they didn't have to um, prioritize also financially so much of what's going on in their own countries, obviously. So it's still soon to, to see what, the, um, what the, the actual manifestation of this will be or how it'll uh, turn out. But I do think that um, if this annexation will happen in the beginning of July, if it would have happened without COVID, the amount of resistance, both from Europe, but also locally on the ground from Palestinian resistance would probably be far higher than what is likely to happen now. People are afraid. People are afraid to go out to the streets. That means that people will be afraid to go out and protest uh, this annexation as well. And it's really, um, I think at this point, uh, both the Israeli and US administrations are really thinking about kind of a slow kind of annexation, um, which allows people to kind of get more used to it and isn't too dramatic. Um, and I think that th that, that may be kind of generally the direction that a lot of uh, the measures we talked about and, and kind of to continue from what Catherine is saying, nothing here is new. This is also not new. This annexation is not new, but you kind of do it with baby steps. Slowly, we allow it to happen. It's like that normalization that I think uh, is, uh, is rather crucial. Um, thank you, Sahar. Back to COVID for just a moment, uh, Owen Devine writes, um, one issue in the US is a lack of surveillance on, on health indicators in general, particularly uh, in the community. Um, he notes that uh, we, the US didn't have enough data on the health of Americans early on to uh, keep track of the spread of the pandemic. And he asked if, if uh, the panelists could discuss this trade-off between a reluctance to, uh, on the part of Americans to allow government or public health officials to have data on our, the status of our health uh, and, and, and what the consequences of that may be for public health outcomes and, and uh, managing a pandemic response. I think from my own perspective, there's a debate in the US about what role the government should have in individuals' health, right? So that's something that is playing out in the US now in the, in the debate between Democrats themselves and between Democrats and Republicans, should the government provide a public health care system? If they did, they would have access to the data, for example. Um, they don't do that. We have private insurers and so the government doesn't have a right to those data. So if you see other countries where governments provide health care and retain the databases, there will be a different set of issues that would be discussed. But I think in the US, you can't expect the government to share data that they're not supposed to be compiling. I'm not saying that they can't have access to that. They probably do, right? Um, but it's up to 
individual private insurers to gather that information. Um, so that's not something, that's something, again, that I, I'm comforted to know that that's being played out in the democratic process, whether or not Americans believe the government should be providing health as one of our human rights or not. And if they were to do that, then would enter into that discussion. If the government compiles the data about health care, do they have a right to share it? And again, in the U.S., there's been pushback against that on both counts, providing it to us as a right, and then what they do with the data. Hmm. Zahar, would you like to have the last word before we close up? Um, sure, and it feels kind of funny to say the last word about something that is very clearly uh, US politics, uh, but um, just, I, I do think that one of the things we are seeing in this pandemic very clearly, uh, as, as Catherine said before, it, it highlights a lot of issues, and I think it, here highlights what it, and, and one of the reasons that I think that it hit the U.S. as hard as it is, uh, as far as casualties going, is that I think that a lot of the structures in the U.S., um, this virus in many ways kind of really picks at, at some of those fundamental issues. Um, at the healthcare system, uh, and, and what does that look like, um, at the competition right. between states, uh, to compete about resources and what did that look like? Um, so actually, there's something about the structure um, of the the way that the U.S. is structured today that was almost ideal for this kind of pandemic. And obviously, for something else, a different system might have had its problems. But I think that one of the things that that really this virus kind of forces uh, the U.S. to look like is what are some of those weak points because it's really been pressing all of them. Um, and, and we've seen what that means in, in people's lives on, on a daily basis. Well, I would like to thank Sahar Vardi and Dr. Catherine Barbary for joining us today. I would like to thank all of you for tuning in uh, and sharing your thoughts and questions. Uh, a quick announcement that uh, Upstate International and the World Affairs Council will be continuing this lecture series a week from today. Our next event is Wednesday, May the 12th at noon. Uh, we will be hosting David Edwards. He is the president and CEO of the Greenville Spartanburg Airport. He'll be talking about the impacts of COVID on the airline industry of air travel. Uh, so thank you all very much. Uh, thanks again to our panelists and I hope you all have a lovely and safe day.